Good morning. I have the pleasure to introduce the first regular talk, uh, regular track for the first conference day here. And um, this track is, and the next track always uh, also is mainly about uh, SSL and HTTPS. And I'm happy to introduce Henning Pearl from the University of Hannover. And he will talk about comparison of SSL validation alternatives. And we will see a connection to our keynote, which we heard I thought in the, in the morning. Okay, yeah, thank you for the introduction. And also, thanks a lot uh, to Angela Sass for uh, the mentioning and the shout out in the keynote this morning. Um, yeah, I will talk about um, comparison and I will compare and talk about different SSL validation mechanisms. And um, this is joint work with uh, Sasha Fahl, um, Michael Brenner, and Matthew Smith. Uh, and we are from the University of Hanover. So, oh. do you need to turn it off somewhere? Okay, okay. I'll get it. Um, so, what I'll, uh, will I be talking about? Um, first, I'm just going to uh, revise what SSL is and what HTTPS is and how we are using it in the web. And then I will talk a little bit about things broken in SSL and especially in HTTPS. Um, and then I will talk about solutions. And especially when looking at SSL validation schemes, we can see that we have a whole variety of solutions and a whole variety of different ideas um, that all add a little bit different um, mechanisms to SSL validation and fix some things but have drawbacks in another. Um, so Next, uh, we talk about what the best solution is. So what, is, what will the future of SSL validation look like, or why there isn't one yet. Uh, and finally, I will propose uh, an evaluation system we came up with and discuss a, bit, a little bit about, bit about that. So just a quick reminder of how SSL works. Um, we have the client, uh, basically, when I mean SSL, now I'm talking about HTTPS. So we are thinking web, we are thinking secure browsing and uh, secure connections to web server. So I have the client on one side and the server on the, one, uh, on the other side. And um, in order to establish a secure connection, the server needs to authenticate to the client first. The server needs to prove that that server is really uh, the server the client wanted to talk to. And how that works is that um, the client trusts a number of CAs. Um, and one of those CAs signs the certificate of the server. And then the server presents um, that signature along with the uh, certificate to the client. And then the client can be sure, because the certificate agency is doing um, its job and uh, looking that the server is really uh, who he proves he is, um, then the client can be sure that once um, the certificate has a valid signature, um, that server is authenticated. So how does it break? Uh, what gets broken? Well, basically, why we need um, validation in the first place is because otherwise, a man in the middle could just present any certificate to the client and then open up a separate connection to the server. So. Even in that case, when the client does validate the certificate it gets, um, the CAs could issue uh, malicious certificates to an attacker. Um, and then the attacker could present a presumably valid certificate um, to the client. And no browser warning would show up. No user interaction would pop up. Uh, the bar would just go green, and um, the client would not be able to tell uh, a valid certificate from a malicious certificate. And the key here really is that those CAs are absolutely trusted. So every CA that is out there in the internet or every CA that has been trusted by your browser, basically, um, has the power to sign off the whole internet. So let's just 
quickly look into the CA ecosystem before I do, uh, for, um, do further talking about SSL in general. Um, those are all CAs and sub-CAs that are being trusted um, by common browsers. Um, the little whirlpool in here is actually the, uh, the German DFN sign, um, which has the nice policy of issuing every university its own sub-CA that can then sign off the whole internet. So that's just how they do things. Um, but also we see that a whole lot of other um, CAs are in the trust store. Um, not, uh, some are not directly in the trust um, in the trust path, but some are in the trust path because a, uh, a CA signed them to be a sub CA that can sign arbitrary certificates. So it's hard to evaluate as a user and even as an expert that all these CAs are trustworthy. Um, and indeed they aren't. They, they don't do things quite uh, as we like them to. Uh, in 2001, VeriSign was compromised and um, that allowed the attacking parties to sign off arbitrary certificates. Uh, in March 2011, uh, the same thing happened to Komodo and actually uh, certificates for Google, Yahoo and Skype amongst others were seen in the wild so attackers were actually exploiting that um, and in August 2011 I think that was uh, the biggest takedown uh, attackers used uh, DigiNota uh, to uh, issue fraud uh, certificates and actually, uh, DigiNota is, uh, I guess, is the only one that is, uh, has been expelled from major trust stores. So I don't think, I don't want to point the fingers at CAs uh, in general. Um, I think the, ma yeah. I don't think point fingers at CAs. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I, think, I think the system is broken. Um, the system is that um, we depend on a weakest link security. We depend on the fact that um, every CA can sign any certificate um, and that is valid for every um, server out there. So it's not that the CAs don't want to do good security. It's, it is if one uh, CA screws up, then the whole internet is insecure. So that's a fundamentally broken um, mechanism. So just as a quick overview for, those, uh, for you, what other things are broken in SSL? I mean, um, certificate, certificate validation is certainly one thing that is broken, um, but there are a whole lot of others. So as uh, Angela Sass, um, pointed out, users ignore warnings, users don't understand warnings, users click through warnings. Um, there was actually um, a very recent paper on uh, Usenix in uh, Washington uh, two weeks ago, where, or uh, one week ago, where um, people, an or where they an analyzed click through rates, uh, where people just click away certificate warnings, and it was around uh, thirty percent of users just clicking through warnings um, so um, another broken thing is uh, that the whole crypto system can be attacked. Uh, we had the beast and the crime attacks uh, we had petting oracle attacks lucky thirteen, and also we had attacks on r c four which is uh, un one of the underlying block ciphers that can be used so there's a lot of irritation even if I do. Um, set up SSL correctly, what are the right parameters? Which crypto algorithms can I, should I, must I use, or which must I ban? Um, then we have SSL stripping, a quite interesting attack where um, that exploits the fact that people don't understand security indicators, for example. People don't understand the padlock, or people can't differentiate the padlock from a firewall icon that looks like a padlock. Um, and basically just tricked them 
to never actually use SSL. When you browse a website um, without uh, a protocol, it goes to HTTP first. And if the SSL stripper blocks the redirect to 443, or um, if the site offers normal content over port 80 uh, as well, then um, the SSL stripper can alter all HTTPS links to actually point to the HTTP uh, target. And therefore, without even exploiting SSL, but just by exploiting how the ecosystem of HTTP and HTTPS works, uh, can then uh, read and tamper with all the data that goes over the wire. So that's, an that's another um, attack. Uh, but also, in, um, as I mentioned in this talk, I will focus about uh, I will focus on SSL validation and the weakest link of CAs. So I mentioned there were a whole lot of um, solutions out there. And I just want to do a quick um, survey in this room. How many people do know all uh, the systems that, are, that I've mentioned here? Perspective, convergence, sovereign keys, certificate transparency, accountability key inf infrastructure, Dane Tech. How many of you do all of them? All of them. All of them. Okay. How, uh, two thirds. How many do know two thirds? Okay, couple of hands. Uh, half of them. Okay, one third. Two. Okay, and one. Okay, and how? Who didn't know any of them? Okay, okay. So I'll um, do this. Um, Can Okay, so, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, it was um, about half of the audience did know two thirds and the other half know one third or less, if I'm summarizing that correctly. But nobody actually knew all or almost all of them in detail. Which is no wonder because, um, um, actually, let me go back then. Which is no wonder because actually ma many of them were just discussed academically or just thrown out there. Uh, and that's why I, uh, we did the research of uh, putting all of them together in one document and doing an evaluation system that evaluates which uh, strengths and weaknesses they all have um, to help make, uh, further, uh, to further aid the discussion. So uh, we have different types of solutions. We have um, the use of network perspectives, where you ask a bunch of people what they see, and then if they all see the same thing, then it must be valid. Uh, second, we have um, the idea to keep a lock of certificates. So each certificate that gets uh, issued also gets thrown into a lock, and then the domain owner, for example, can look at the lock and can see um, what kind of certificates were issued for this for my domain, and do I have all of them, or did some malicious attacker um, trick SCA into issuing a certificate, and um, so I need to revoke that key, for example, or do need to do some extra actions. Then we have the idea to serve uh, certificates over DNS. So each time you make a DNS request, you don't only get not only get the um, IP address but you also get the certificate that you should expect. And finally, we have some variation of trust and first use. Um, to just summarize the principle, it's the first time you you're not sure if this uh, server is really the server you want to connect to, but the second time um, you want to see the same certificate that you saw the first time. Uh, and I will go over all of these principles uh, more in detail and pick out one um, of the systems um, to explain it a little bit more in detail. So first we have the idea of network perspectives, and that's actually a quite old idea. Uh, perspectives is, um, was published uh, by Adrian Perrick, and um, as I mentioned, um, it has the notion of notaries, so a whole lot of different um, trustworthy uh, entities on the internet can run those notaries, universities, Google for example, Microsoft, whatever, big companies um, 
or even private organizations and pri or private people um, can run those notaries. And for e each connection that the client makes, uh, it also makes a request to all the notaries. So if I connect to google.com, I would also connect, uh, ask all the notaries what certificate they see for google.com, and then they will go to google.com and um, download the certificate and forward it back to me. So basically the idea is if someone sits in the middle between my connection and the server, it does not succeed at intercepting each connection to the end notaries as well, because um, the attacker, or that's the assumption, the attacker usually sits uh, near the client. So um, the benefit of that is that uh, we don't need to upgrade the server. The server just runs, uh, the server just serves certificates, and um, the client can query the the notaries um, in parallel to connecting to the server. Uh, and actually, there's a Firefox plugin for conversions, for example, which works in a uh, quite similar way. Uh, but the, uh, the disadvantage is, uh, of course, network delay. So we need to wait for all notaries to answer and um, always privacy. So if I ask N people, uh, for each domain that I connect to um, what that uh, domain's uh, certificate is, then I leak my browsing history, or at least the domains that I browse to, um, to all the end notaries. And there was some um, convergence, actually, by Moxie Spike. Uh, he did some uh, extensions to that. He did some modifications to uh, do onion routing between the client and the notaries. Um, but it's only uh, via two steps, so that can be reversed as well. Um, so next we have the idea of uh, <laughs> keeping a lot of a lock of certificates, and that is um, sovereign keys by the EFF, uh, certificate transparency by Google, and uh, AKI by uh, Adrian Perrick and others, um, which basically Starting from this SSL, normal SSL setup where I trust the CA, the CA signs the key and then the, the server authenticates to me, um, adds a lot of certificates so that the certificates uh, agencies uh, or the certificate authorities um, submit uh, uh, the certificates that they sign to the certificate log, and then the client can query a proof of inclusion for that certificate that it got presented. Um, so um, the client not only trusts the CAs that they don't sign malicious certificates, but also if the client gets presented a certificate, it can see or it can make the certificate log prove to him that the certificate is actually public, that it, the certificate is public knowledge. And by that, the security is basically, okay, if the certificate has been published, um, then the domain owner um, could um, take measurements when um, the certificate was uh, signed maliciously by a front CA, for example. So the idea is not directly to um, prevent attacks, but uh, more to make the whole ecosystem behave well and to make um, fraud and CAs um, obvious. So with that scheme, um, one hopes to um, ensure that if certificate agent uh, authorities um, sign malicious certificates, then it'll be public knowledge um, in a short time. So the advantage, once again, is um, that we have no extra software on the server. Um, the proof or the, the sh a short timestamp that the certificate uh, will be added to the certificate log is embedded directly in this 
uh, in the certificate. And also we have no extra network delay. But if we do not have extra ne network delay, then we can query the um, certificate lock during the SSL handshake, and but, but must, must do it later. So we may still get attacked, but before a lot of people get attacked, someone will notice. So it's kind of a fuzzy security in that sense. You could also make it blocking. So, so you could also say, okay, I don't want to do the SSL handshake before I don't know that the certificate is in the log. And then um, you have extra network delay, uh, but you also have um, the protection uh, that you get a positive or negative answer from the log right away. And also we need a new infrastructure. So we need someone to run the certific certificate log and we need to get the CAs um, to submit their certificates to the log as well. So um, the next idea is to serve the certificates of a Dane. Again, starting from uh, the same old status quo, um, we add, or we actually have a DNS server, right? Uh, but in that sense, the domain admin, so the one that runs the uh, DNS server, submits the certificate and signs the certificate. Um, and then the signed certificate is added or is embedded directly in the DNS record. And when the client queries the DNS server, it'll get the certificate along with the DNS response, which sounds really nice, really elegant. I mean, we have almost all of that infrastructure. So the biggest drawback of that is that we need DNSSEC. And um, if any of you follow the uh, long and slow deployment of DNSSEC, uh, we can kind of estimate that uh, it'll take a long time until DNSSEC is deployed and until we can talk about Dane in detail. On the plus side, we don't need anything extra on the server and we reuse um, the same infrastructure that we have right now. So it's, it's quite elegant, but it has a lot of drawbacks uh, of, using, of requiring the use of DNSSEC. Because otherwise, someone could just spoof the DNS response. That's the main, uh, the main problem with that one. So if we don't have uh, security on that side, uh, where the certificate uh, gets served, and someone could just swap out the certificate and serve, uh, point the client to its own IP address, serve an another um, certificate, and uh, the client would notice. So last but, last but, but not least, we have um, pinning and um, as a representative tag by Maximal and Spike, um, where um, the system behaves uh, slightly different depending on whether I connect to the server for the first time or for the second and for the times after that. So on the first connection, um, the server sends along uh, in the SSL handshake a tag public key, which is basically um, the public key which, um, or um, a public pri private key pair and the private key pair uh, or the private key he used um, to sign the actual certificate and the public key uh, or the tag public key he sends out with a um, SSL handshake and then the client does pinning on the tag public key uh, which is a slightly benefits over using uh, pinning directly on the certificate that the server can swap out the certificates as long as uh, he signs the certificate with the same um, tag private key uh, on, of which the client pinned the public key, then uh, the client uh, can still validate the certificate fine. And also I can do, you know, I can have a whole server farm and um, issue a lot of certificates and uh, a lot of different certificates and I can sign each certificate with my tag public key uh, and do and the client uh, does on oh, with a tag private key, so um, and the client does pinning on the public key. So that's why we have an extra layer of tag keys 
uh, along with uh, many certificates. So for one domain, I can have many certificates, but I have one task public key. Um, so first connection is insecure. Um, connections after that are secure because um, the client um, validates that the certificate is signed by the TAC private key. So what are advantages with that? Uh, we don't need extra software on the server um, because everything is, can be embedded into the certificate. So normal SSL uh, software works. Uh, we have no CAs, which is nice, so if anybody doesn't like CAs or doesn't like going to some kind of uh, bureaucracy um, just to get the server signed, um, that's nice. Um, the big drawback is that it doesn't protect you the first time you visit the site with a device, so um, something can be compensated by uh, doing some kind of gossiping or sharing the TAC keys, but out of the box, the first time you connect to it, you have no idea if it's valid or not. So what are the conclusions? I um, hope I made your head spin a little with all of these different ideas on how to secure uh, SSL validation. Um, which system is actually the best? Um, so we don't, we didn't know, we don't, we still don't know, but we uh, thought that it would be really nice to compare those solutions and to categorize those solutions and to see which solutions offer which aspect and which aspects do we need when we look at SSL validation uh, after all. So our goal was um, to create a tool um, to compare solutions. Um, to help um, or to aid the discussion about which properties are important um, and to organize and formal, uh, formalize the debate. Because right now, uh, a lot of researchers just threw out more and more solutions or more and more ideas and, oh, by the way, here's my idea on how we're kind of gonna fix that mess. And, oh, here's mine. But nobody really built up on something. So we did one large table um, we, um, for each column, uh, we wrote down one benefit. We had 12, we have 12 deployability benefits and nine security and privacy benefits. And also we looked at adversary capabilities. So, um, for which capabilities or which capabilities does an adversary, someone that wants to um, maliciously eavesdrop on the connection, a man in the middle attack, what kind of powers does he need? So first thing that is, that's basic is he needs um, to sit in the middle and do active, um, an active in the man in the middle attack, meaning he, he can tamper with the bits on the wire. Um, second, um, or the next level is that um, he also has a trusted CA certificate. So at that point, SSL, as we know it today, fails or falls because then uh, the attacker can basically eavesdrop on the connection. Uh, for all other solutions, that's not true. So all other solutions don't fall uh, just because um, a trusted CA certificate is required. Um, the adversary has a, has a trusted CA certificate. With exception to uh, certificate transparency, where the, the attack might go through, but the CA that signed the certificate maybe will be in trouble because then the whole world knows that they sign malicious certificates. Um, so the third level of adversary capabilities is uh, to compromise um, N user-chosen third parties. So along with you have an active man in the middle attack and you have a trusted um, uh, CA certificate, you can also tamper with the output of uh, or compromise um, and third parties. So at that point, um, every uh, system fails. And to just give you a quick example of that, um, for, uh, I talked about the notaries where you have N notaries. Well, if the attacker could also spoof the answers of those N notaries, um, 
then the user would think that um, that is a valid certificate and the server is actually the server I wanted to talk to and um, the system is compromised. Um, so that is the table. I don't want to go over it in all detail. I think that's more uh, something to look at uh, in the paper than to look at it in a PowerPoint slide, uh, especially because uh, that pa uh, sheet of paper says that I should use large fonts. Um, but to just give you an overview of how it looks like, um, we have uh, benchmarked all the systems against um, SSL with uh, the CA PKI, which is the current system, and then we um, awarded uh, Benefits, uh, that's a black circle or uh, almost benefit, that's half circle, or it does not offer this, uh, the benefit, which is a blank circle. And then uh, for the man in the middle uh, adversary capabilities, um, we used those kind of arrows. And then for each adversary capability, we looked at if the system is still secure with an adversary of that power. So the SSL it, um, with CA PKI is secure on first contact protection and uh, on all other connections uh, when the adversary can just tamper with the bits on the, uh, on the wire. But as uh, soon as it'll get to um, get hold of a valid CA certificate, it's not secure anymore, and so on. So uh, I encourage you to look at the table. Uh, I also encourage you to find errors to tell us what you think is wrong and to engage in the discussions. Um, and we will be more than happy to um, revise and further um, extend those, um, uh, this table. And also, if you think that uh, we left something out on the deployability and security uh, benefits, then please tell us. So. Uh, this is meant as an ongoing document and is meant as a roadmap to what we think uh, SSL validations should look like. And ultimately, we would get to a system that is uh, black, uh, has black circles all the way through. Um, so, as a conclusion, um, all systems that, that we looked at have some um, problems, uh, have some strengths. All proposals solve the weakest link um, property of current CA systems, but in very different ways. In one way, I ask a whole bunch of people on the internet, and they tell me uh, if the connection looks good. Uh, some depend on uh, the notion that, well, somehow, it gets obvious that, this, that the CA misbehaves, and so on. <clears throat> so as we have no clear winner, uh, we um, can start some discussions of um, how SSL validation should look like. How should I ultimately prove that a certificate that I've never seen before from a source that I can validate um, is valid or not? So how do I trust this? Do I want some kind of a web of trust, do I want, like we have it now, some kind of notary, uh, no, um, certification agency uh, or authority that people can go to and claim with their um, ID that they are really the one that they claim to be and then uh, that get, uh, the certificate gets issued? Uh, or do we have a whole different idea? Uh, do we want, need, or have to have um, CAs, that's, that's a big question. Also what we found out that uh, deployment is really challenging. So even if I have the perfect system, even if I know um, how the system should behave in every little detail, um, the migration is uh, quite hard. Um, and just, just to give a quick example, um, if I do some kind of extra information querying during the handshake or during in the certificate. Um, an attacker could, in almost all scenarios, uh, claim to just be an old server that hasn't upgraded yet. 
So how do we prevent falling back to the old security in the time where we migrate from the old system to the new system? And that's quite tricky because um, if we can't fix that, then we don't have an incentive for servers to upgrade. If I upgrade my server, but um, an attacker could just claim to still use the old system, I have no incentive to upgrade, right? So, and the other big question is when to fail hard or do we want to fail hard? So can we actually build a system that is so perfect that um, every time I get a certificate warning, it's actually an attack. Because if that's the case, I don't even need um, user warnings anymore. I can just fail. So um, that's also an interesting thing to consider. And by the way, uh, Chrome already does this for um, certificates that are pinned um, directly in their source code. So for um, some certificates, for example, for their own Google domains, um, if you see another certificate that does not come from Google, um, then um, you can click away the warning. So the question is, do we want that? Can we do that for the whole internet? Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of uh, further things to discuss and further things to speak about. So I'll be taking questions now. Thank you very much for giving us an overview about the landscape of SSL validation methods. Um, and Henning, I really, really like your translation of the acronym CA as a certificate agency. <laughs> I think certificate authority is an internet use speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time uh, for some questions. Okay. Adam, please can you repeat the question yeah. for sure. the recording? Sure. Okay, so the question was, how can I trust that the proof of inclusion is really um, valid or that the server, uh, that the certificate log doesn't lie to me or maybe that that's a malicious log that just wants to um, trick me into trusting that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, um, to explain that in detail, I would, go, uh, I would need to go a lot uh, more into detail. Uh, of how CT, for example, works, but they do that by um, using Merkle hash tree. So um, you have leaves and you hash all the leaves, and then for the node up, you hash the left and the right node. So um, going up, you have a data structure that changes if any of the um, leaves change. So um, then you can construct very concise proofs by um, adding to that proof um, the hashes of all the nodes that branch from the path from the leaf to the root. And um, then anybody can validate that um, that certificate along with the proof does really lead to the uh, top root hash. So just a quick overview how that works. Uh, the consequence of this data structure and the way they do it is that um, the log answers are transparent and that's what the certificate transparency actually means. It means that if the log lies to you, it has to lie to everybody and, all, um, um, and though the certificate uh, log is public then, and anybody can audit that, uh, someone will notice that um, a new certificate has been added. So in order to lie to you, um, the certificate log needs to insert a new certificate into the log, and then anybody could notice it. So, yeah. Any more questions? Let us start here on the right side here, please. I think it's inheriting fundamental uh, 
problem of the SSL and CA by having a kind of what looks like a push mechanism between the CA and the pre -prolong. So if I, this is assuming that this attacker, after reaching the CA and being able to steal the CA uh, basic uh, cert for uh, <coughs> enabling himself, himself or herself to sign certificates, is not able to prevent the submitting of Um, yeah, the, the way they solve that is um, that only if you submit your log to the, uh, or only if you submit your certificate to the log, you will get a um, signed certificate timestamp in your certificate. So, and if you don't, and that's directly embedded into the certificate, and if you don't have that, cl clients don't trust you. So if you don't submit your certificate to the log, it will not get trusted by the, by clients, by new clients. So we have the the kind of the, the upgrade um, or the migration thing again. So what happens in the time between where a server does not present uh, or presents a certificate without a timestamp from the log server? But ultimately, if we would all use this, then uh, then clients could just say. I don't trust you if you don't, uh, if you have not submitted your certificate to the log. We have still time for two very brief questions and very brief answers. Okay. I've seen one in the, uh, and then Angela for the last question. Uh, Well, to work correctly in all cases, cases except for one, um, that's not something that is possible by the, the underlying data structure because if it is malicious by one certificate, it would still need to provide me with a proof from that certi uh, certificate's hash to the root hash. So in that sense, that certificate needs to be part of the tree. But I, if I maliciously add one certificate to the tree, the root hash changes as well. And so maybe I have not made that clear enough. Um, the certificate log needs to distribute those root hashes um, to the clients. So the client pre-trusts um, the root hashes. And if trusting the root hash, it can validate that all certificates are public knowledge. So. Excuse me, uh, can we postpone the discussion of very technical aspects of the break because we are short in time? And the last question uh, by Angela. So you listed the fact that users just accept, you know, don't ignore the warnings as one of the key problems. Right. So, but the reason that they, that they don't um, pay attention to them is because they've been effectively trained to swap them away because of the right. high number of false positives. Right. So which of those solutions do you think, does any of them offer a path, and I didn't see that as your criteria, a path towards generating fewer false positives? Um, yeah, th that's a tricky question to estimate because um, that, I mean, and we, we did, we do some research into looking at why um, web administrators set up self-signed certificates or certificates that are not in the trust path. Um, ultimately, um, and we, we see a lot of similar similarities between why users click away warnings and why uh, server administrators use self-signed certificates because they don't understand the risk. And um, I believe that in every scenario, it's kind of possible to screw up again, to, to just use self-signed certificates, more or less. Um, um, so we didn't put that into our criteria just because it's hard to prove that in the future, if we def all deploy it, we will generate less SSL warnings by 
admins that don't understand SSL. Of course, it's hard to prove. <laughs> Henning, thank you okay. very much. Thank you.